The way we do like to kick this off is with a short presentation on some facts, trends, uh, data. So uh, to do that this year, we've asked the Executive Vice President of the Pew Research Center, uh, has been the Director of the Center's Social and Demographic, Demographic Trends Project and the Pew Hispanic Center. Um, he has been a longtime reporter, uh, most of which was for the Washington Post, where among other things, he was Bureau Chief in South Africa during the historic period of uh, the changeover from apartheid. Uh, he's written a number of, of books, including The Old News Versus the New News, and See How They Run, um, since he helped start and run and chair uh, the Alliance for Better Campaigns, uh, which was looking at campaign reform. Uh, so please welcome Paul Taylor. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, uh, David. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, the Pew Research Center, we call ourselves a fact tank. We, we do a lot of our own surveys. We analyze a lot of census data. I'm going to give you a presentation that is going to be very thick with numbers. So if you don't like numbers, you're auditing the wrong course. Um, I think the numbers will illuminate this discussion, this very important discussion. Uh, they can tell us something about attitudes. They can tell us something about outcomes and experiences. But at the end of the day, these numbers have their limits. They can't go inside the human heart. And on a subject like this that is so close to the bone, uh, just please take the numbers for what they're worth and understand, uh, understand their limitations. Uh, so let's, let's jump into it. I'm going to cover a lot of territory in a very short time. I'm a native of Brooklyn. I talk fast. Uh, it's probably too much for you to absorb. But part of this is just to throw a lot out there uh, and see uh, what sticks. Oop. Um, so here's our first chart, and this, this looks at a uh, 100-year period from 1950, to, uh, projects forward to 2050, and it simply gives a, a racial breakdown of the country. And if we go back uh, to 1950, we have a country that's 87 percent white, and by 2050, we will be a country that is 47 percent white. That's a lot of movement in the, in the course of our century. Um, the phrase that some use, it's, a, it's an oxymoronic phrase, is by the middle of the century we will be a majority-minority country. It's an odd term, or perhaps better, a country with, with no majority. But uh, if, then if you look at the, other, uh, at the other parts of this above the white, you see that blacks, who are now at about 13 uh, percent, aren't going to change much. The action in terms of the change in the face of the country really comes from Asians and Hispanics. And again, if you start at 1950, you don't see a line for Asians because they're less than 1 percent of the country, and Hispanics are 3 percent. Now carry forward to the middle of this, uh, uh, the middle of this century, Hispanics at 29, Asians at 9. So one lesson is, uh, where whites will be a minority by mid-century. The next lesson is that the old racial paradigm, which is binary, white or black, is changing, and it's much more multi-hued, multicultural. Um, changes like this, when you put it up on a screen, are pretty dramatic. But demographic change is actually a drama in slow motion. This change happens incrementally, imperceptibly. Nobody calls a press conference to say, hey, take a look at this. Every so often, however, a moment comes along when we as a society stand back and take cognizance of these changes, and that's, that's an aha moment. And that aha moment was the moment David referred to uh, a, a, a bit ago. So Barack Obama gets, uh, it stands for re-election last year in the face of very strong headwinds, uh, you know, more than 8 percent unemployment for virtually his entire presidency, difficult, difficult times. A lot of people thought he, didn't, he wasn't going to win. He actually won, not only won, he won pretty handily. He won by about five million votes. It was not that close an election. And this is how he won. And if you look at the three bars up top and you add all of those up, that's the non-white vote. That was 26, a record high, 26 percent of the electorate. And Barack Obama got 80 percent of the non-white vote. Now let's take a look at the white vote, where Mitt Romney wins the white vote by 20 percentage points. The last candidate who ran for president who won the white vote by that big a landslide was George H.W. Bush in 1988. And in 1988, 24 years ago, winning the white vote by 20 percentage points got you an electoral college landslide 
of 426 electoral college votes. That same percentage in 2012 got you 206 electoral college votes. Whites, in the course of 24 years, lost 220 electoral college votes worth of clout. That, I would suggest, is an aha moment that is affecting a lot of our politics today and going forward. <clears throat> Here is a look at the two immigrant groups. It's immigration that is driving this multicultural, this new, more complicated racial equation. And it's Hispanics and Asians who are at the heart of the modern immigration wave. Immig we, are, we are a nation of immigrants. In the 19th and 20th century, 90% of our immigrants were from Europe. Uh, in this era, uh, half of all of our immigrants are Hispanic. Nearly 30% are Asian. And uh, here, is, here is a presidential vote for the Democratic candidate among Hispanics and Asians. And if you look at 1980, uh, Ronald Reagan loses 59% of the Hispanic vote. And shortly thereafter, he says famously, uh, Hispanics are, are Republicans who don't know it yet. Well, cast your eyes forward 30 years, they still don't know it yet. What Reagan was doing was taking the template of immigrants and successive generations that he knew from the 20th century, uh, which was the immigrants arrive, and when they arrived, it was often the big city Democratic machines that drew them in, and they became very reliable Democrats, and they voted for FDR and going forward. But their children and their grandchildren, who lived in the ethnic neighborhoods of Philadelphia, of Chicago, uh, the Irish, the Poles, the Italians, over time, became not only, not only lost their heavy attachment to the Democratic Party, but the, the Republican Party, Reagan in particular, did very well for them. So he was sort of assuming that that political template would carry forward. Well, clearly it hasn't. It's gone up and down a little bit among Hispanics, but again, over 70% for Barack Obama last year. And Asians, and we, we, we can only chart them starting in the mid-90s, uh, also moving toward the Democratic Party. So this has caught the attention uh, of both political parties, and if you want to know why we're having a serious immigration debate for the first time in the modern era, despite our tough economy, generally speaking, tough economies lead countries to raise the walls a little bit higher. We're looking to open our arms a little bit, and I don't know exactly how that d debate will play out, but I would suggest that this is driving a lot of change there. Here's one more political slide which, uh, which shows the turnout rate of the four groups we have been talking about. And the top two are whites and blacks, and what's interesting there is over the course of the last 15 or 20 years, blacks have closed an historic turnout gap with whites. This only goes through 2008. We're going to get some census numbers in a week or two. It's not inconceivable that in 2012, the black turnout as a share of eligible voters was higher than the white turnout. That would be for the first time in history. Uh, that suggests the mobilization that obviously Barack Obama is personally responsible for, but it actually, it actually begins even before Barack Obama comes on the scene. What's interesting is that the two, the two largely immigrant groups uh, and their children, uh, these are now shares of, of turnout among eligible voters, and, and uh, Hispanics and Asians are only at about 50 percent, whereas whites and blacks are at 66 percent. The point here is that the actual, the vote that captured so much attention last year is not a leading indicator of change, it's a lagging indicator of change. 26% uh, of the electorate last year was non-white, but 38% of the country is non-white. And as we go forward, as more of those non-whites age into the electorate, as more become citizens, and as more choose to participate, the politics is going to change even more. Let's move uh, to some slides on education and, uh, and economics. Here's a share of all adults uh, who have a college degree. Uh, what jumps out at me, and perhaps to you, is, is the Asian number. Asian, the, the Asian adult population is 72 percent immigrant. About half of them say they don't speak English very well. This is the best educated cohort of immigrants in our, in our country's history, bar none. If you just look at Asian immigrants who have come in the last five or ten years, more than 60 percent of them either arri arrive with or shortly after they arrive, by the time they're age 25, they have a college degree or more. We've never had an immigrant uh, population like this. And this then ex tends to explain, in a knowledge-based economy, the economic success of this group. Again, this is mostly an immigrant group, and in terms of median income, you see uh, that Asians surpass whites uh, by a little bit and, and surpass Hispanics 
and blacks by a more considerable margin. The gap between black median income and white median income as shown here is about blacks are about 60% of whites, Hispanics are about 66% of whites. Those numbers uh, have waxed and waned a little bit, but they have been pretty constant over the years, and they give some sense of the relative economic well-being of the groups. But I would emphasize only some sense, because in some ways a more telling statistic is, is the wealth gap. Wealth is the sum of everything you own, your house, your car, uh, any financial assets you have, minus everything you owe, your home mortgage, your, your, your car loan, your student loans, uh, your credit card debt. And here you see the size of the economic disparities, and they are very, very large and sometimes lost in the conversation. Uh, so uh, today at the median, the, the, the typical black household, the white household has 12 times more wealth than the typical Hispanic household, 14 times more wealth than the typical black household. Yeah, of those two minority groups, roughly 30 to 35 percent of each uh, households in each of those groups have zero or negative net wealth. So net wealth is, is your rainy day fund. N net wealth is what you fall back on when you lose a job, when you have an unexpected medical expense. It's what you retire on. It's what, it's what you use to get your kids through college. So there's a lot of disparity here on economic well-being um, that uh, that's, and, and, the, and by the way, these numbers have grown. If you go back to the mid-90s, the gap was more in the order of 6 to 1, 8 to 1. Uh, through the bad economy of the last years, the groups who have started out most challenged economically have fallen further behind. Nonetheless, this, this to me is a, a fascinating slide that's one of many I could have showed. Uh, we're looking at attitudes among, in this case, whites and blacks just towards the state of the national economy. And the question is, what share of each group says they think the national economy is, is good or, or excellent? And if you start in 2004, whites are about four times more likely than blacks to say the economy is good or excellent. 2004, the economy was churning along, uh, the bubbles were inflating, you know, things, things were great. Uh, then we move to uh, 2007, 2008. We know what happens then. The, the, the housing market collapses, the stock market collapses, we head into this very deep recession, and you see the plunge in white attitudes. But you don't see a plunge in black attitudes. To the contrary, they started very low, but if anything, they've gone up a little bit. What else happened in 2008? Uh, Barack Obama got elected President of the United States, and, and uh, what we began to see in 2008 with this slide, and I could have showed a half dozen others that capture the attitudes of African Americans, their perceptions of their own well-being, their group well-being, the state of the nation, take a turn for the better. And, and, I, and, and I think probably many of you may have been on the mall four and a half years ago when Barack Obama was first inaugurated. You certainly remember, remember that moment. And, it, it, is, it is an extraordinary moment, and, and, and it, it, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be under, understated. You know, there's a new movie that's just out, a Jackie Robinson story, uh, that celebrates the breaking of the color line in baseball about 65, 70 years ago. And it's, it's a story of one man's courage and grace, and it was, it was, it was um, Branch Rickey, a, a baseball executive, that had the wisdom to say America was ready for this moment. Four years ago, it was 130 million Americans who, who said, we are ready for this moment. And that, uh, you know, that needs to be, that needs, I would think, to be celebrated. Um, I'm getting, uh, <laughs> got to go quickly here. All right, we, uh, how well does your group get along with other groups? Uh, what you see here among Hispanics and uh, Asian Americans is that on various markers of assimilation and feeling as if you're a part of the community, the second generation, the children of immigrants, show a greater sense of being a part of the community. This is the sort of trajectory that I think one would want and one sees um, going forward. Let me, the last set of slides has to do with not just getting along better with other groups, but it has to do with, with, a, with a deeper barrier. When Barack Obama's parents were married in Hawaii in 1961, our best estimate looking at census data is that something on the order of magnitude of one marriage in 1,000 was between a black person and a white person. It was still illegal in 16 states. It was a gasp-inducing taboo virtually everywhere else. 
Today, one marriage in six or seven is, be is between somebody of a different race and ethnicity. This is a lot of change, and this is a change, frankly, in the human heart. If you break it down by recent marriages, marriages in 2010, about 10% of whites and 17% of blacks, more than a quarter of Hispanics and Asians marry someone outside their race and ethnicity. Uh, there are some interesting gender patterns here we can't get into, but uh, black men three times more likely than black women to quote marry out Asian women nearly three times more likely than Asian men to marry out. Although whites do so uh, at, at, at lower levels, they're still the majority group, so about 70% of all intermar racial intermarriages in this country uh, are one of the spouses is white. This raises an interesting identity challenge. What are we going to call the children of those marriages? What, what will the children of those marriages call themselves? What, what do we call Barack Obama? We have a product of that marriage living at 10 blocks up Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, the country is divided on this. Uh, whites, uh, you know, given a choice, say, well, mixed race. Blacks say, no, black. But neither of them, frankly, are, you know, there's a, there's a strong consensus on neither. And this gets, this gets to a notion of we're heading for a place racially where I don't think we fully defined it yet. Um, this, comes up, this comes up with Hispanics and Asians. We made, a, we made a decision in our census, in our government, to call Hispanics Hispanics in 1976. We decree they are an ethnicity, not a race. Uh, and that label has never really particularly stuck with Hispanics. Hispanics come from 22 Spanish-speaking countries. The word Hispanic doesn't really exist in those countries. It only exists here. And it's a label we've put on Hispanics. And when we asked Hispanics, what, 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 do you, what, do you mo what word do you use most often to describe yourself? Do you use your country of origin? I'm Mexican-American, I'm Cuban-American. Do you use Hispanic or Latino? Or do you just say you're an American? And here you see that the, the ethnic label or the racial label isn't fully embraced. It's not fully embraced for Asian-Americans. So Asian-Americans are most likely to say, I'm Chinese-American, I'm Filipino. Uh, if you go to the second generation of these groups, uh, the number calling themselves American tends to go up. But there's a lot of identity, there's a lot of identity difficulty. It's the census form is particularly difficult for Hispanics. Everybody is asked on the census form first, are you Hispanic or not? And Hispanics say, uh, yes, I'm Hispanic. And then they're asked a follow-up question, well, what's your race? And a lot of Hispanics, it's like a riddle. Wait a minute, I just said I was Hispanic. Uh, then they're given the race choice, but there's no Hispanic there. Uh, and about half of them call themselves white, even though in every way we can signal as a society that we don't think they're white. We've told them that we don't think they're white. We think they're Hispanic. And then about a third say, well, I'm some other race because they can't find themselves. The Census Bureau is, is working this out. They may collapse those two questions into one. These are not easy. The Census has changed racial categorizations every 10 years for most of our history. It's very complicated, but it is an interesting question uh, going to the year 2050, what will we call ourselves? All the categories that I've just, that I've just shown you, I've broken down by, by four groups, Hispanic, Asian, white, black. Uh, and in some ways, I think that our changing, uh, our norms are, and, and, and most of those categories are, have been driven through our history by, by basically the one, the one drop rule. When Barack Obama, filled out his census form, he said he was African-American. Disappointing, actually, some people who wished he had taken the opportunity to declare himself to be more than one race. And in effect, his response was, look, you grow up, you look like me, you grow up in America, you, you know, who's kidding whom? I'm, I'm a black guy. And th that at least, th that certainly makes some sense. But, you know, I think we're heading to a place where the rigidity of the one-drop rule is, is going to be replaced by more nuance and subtlety and shading. So here's a, list of, here's a list of pretty familiar and pretty glamorous people. And the only thing they share is that they are all mixed race. And whether or not they're mixed race or not is not necessarily a huge part of their identity. But in most societies in the world, mixed race is a difficult identity designation. Oftentimes, you're between two worlds and you're an outcast to both worlds. In a, the America of 2012, it seems to me, you know, at least at the celebrity level, there may be some cachet to it. Most people don't live these glamorous lives or this beautiful or this talented and everything else. But who we choose to elect as our celebrities, if you will, does say a little something about who we are. 
and I think we're moving to a different place. And here's, here's my final slide, which is, uh, this, these may be hard to read, but this is uh, a photographic exhibit done by a, a photographer and artist named uh, Kip Fullback. He's actually the middle of those three pictures. And what he did was just took headshots of mixed race people uh, and, 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 and asked them to give a very brief identity statement about who they are. And, and I like these three statements because they capture the complexity uh, of who we are becoming and how we are evolving our attitudes towards race. So the fellow on the left says, uh, I'm 100% uh, black and I'm 100% Japanese. So he's, he's embracing, if you will, the mosaic idea about race, that we, we, we hang on to the individual parts of ourselves, and when you put those parts together, it makes an interesting whole. Uh, Kip Fullback in the middle uh, says, I'm exactly like everybody else is going to be in the year 2500. That's more the melting pot notion of race, that as we mix and as, as we get more subtle and shaded, we'll sort of all blend together. And the young woman on the uh, right says, what, my, uh, my last boyfriend says he liked me because of my race, so I dumped him. So <laughs> she, she's, got some, she's got some attitude. No one's going to tell her what race she is or whether we should like what race she is. But maybe she's also got a little bit of whimsy there. And, and that is the note that I would, that I would end on. I, don't, I, I, I think we are, we are uh, listen, race, uh, uh, race is our oldest and deepest wound. We have done a lot wrong as a society for 400 years on race. My own sense is that the arc of history is bending towards tolerance, towards pluralism, towards diversity. Uh, that is a very good thing, particularly after the troubling week we have had. It's a good thing to remind ourselves that while we've done a lot, a lot wrong with race, we also do a lot right with race. Thank you very much. <laughs>